Hello and welcome to episode number 25 of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I am your host. This podcast features interviews with accomplished performing musicians who are doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll unpack their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. And it's my hope that these interviews will provide value no matter where you are on your musical journey. If you're thinking about a career in music, if you are a music school now, a working musician, or if you're a music lover and just curious to learn more. My guest this week is Meredith Snow. She's a Long Island native, a graduate of the Juilliard School, a violist in the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and chair of Ixom, the International Conference of Symphony and Opera Musicians. Before joining the LA Phil, Meredith toured the United States, Europe, and Brazil as a member of the Colorado String Quartet and was a member of the San Francisco Opera for three seasons. But the lion's share of her career has been in the LA Phil, an institution that has been at the tip of the spear of our industry for decades. It's essentially a cliche at this point to list their accolades, accomplishments, innovations, and all the well-deserved critical acclaim. But that the LA Phil has sustained momentum over decades merits some reflection. Progress there is not a feature of one leader or one leadership team. Progress and innovation is intergenerational. It is ingrained. It is institutionalized. I was interested in hearing what that organizational evolution has been like from a frontline musician standpoint, but also what of that she's brought back to her leadership role in Ixom. Meredith keeps coming back to the idea of communication, deepening relationships across existing stakeholders and the need to go out and make new friends. And Ixom is what she calls the connective tissue of our workforce, where orchestral musicians can learn from each other have conversations and exchange ideas. And her point is that funding follows big ideas and a big vision. Meredith stresses that our vision must be one that is inclusive and reflective of America. This of course is the great challenge for all American institutions and our nation as a whole. There's a new book by the UMass Amherst professor, Ethan Zuckerman called Mistrust why losing faith in institutions provides the tools to transform them. The book was published before January 6th, when domestic terrorists stormed the Capitol. So his terminology here takes on a little bit of a different tone. So we should make a distinction, I think, between how he uses the term insurrectionist versus how we might hear it reflexively now. Paraphrasing the author and pundit Chris Hayes, Zuckerman writes, quote, Tension is between institutionalists and insurrectionists. Institutionalists believe that the key to solving the nation's problems is to revitalize and strengthen existing organs of power, congresses and parliaments, political parties and unions, businesses and civic organizations. Insurrectionists believe existing systems are rigged, ineffective and wholly broken, and that change will come only from overthrowing existing systems and replacing them with new systems, or perhaps nothing at all." Close quote. And the institutions of classical music, our orchestras, music schools, and our unions are experiencing this tension as well. And to a degree, we certainly earn some of that criticism. And I think there are also some fundamental misunderstandings about how institutions function and why they exist. And Meredith is a great advocate and explainer for ours. She's a great example of what the book describes as radical institutionalists. Someone who believes that the best way to affect important change is through organized collective action. As musicians, as union members, we're lucky to have Meredith where she is. And it was a pleasure to talk with her and to dig into some thorny industry topics. Very briefly, before we get to the interview, a little bit of trivia that listeners of this podcast might be interested in. I mentioned... LA's mayor, Eric Garcetti, at the very top of this interview. His grandparents met during the Depression at the Eastman School of Music here in Rochester, where they were both studying the piano. That grandfather, Harry Roth, after putting aside a career in music, went on to become a well-known tailor. In particular, his most famous client was President Lyndon Johnson. 
And we had a little bit of audio interference at the top, but it clears up quite quickly. I apologize for that, and I appreciate your patience. And please enjoy this interview with Meredith Snow. Meredith Snow, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure. I've enjoyed listening to your show, and it's exciting for me to be the star. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed, I am, you are. after all, just a violist. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a violist at that and uh, someone who's gone on to some really, really interesting stuff that affects so many people in this industry. So I thought it'd be important to talk with you. A couple of years ago, I remember hearing your mayor, Eric Garcetti, talk about when he was being peppered with questions about a possible presidential run, talking about where America is going, where America's future is. Los Angeles is already there. And his point being, I think that demographically, uh, issues around transportation, uh, housing issues, all these big issues facing American society, Los Angeles was already tackling those things or they were already there. And in a similar way, all the things that our industry talks about, the symphonic industry talks about, the LA Phil in its own way is already there. These issues of uh, new music, uh, diversity, uh, getting into the community, expanding your reach, ideal acoustical spaces. Uh, you guys have been doing that now for many, many years. And I'm curious about, though, your perspective, having had a front row seat to that and been an active participant in this metamorphosis of an institution as the center of gravity has swung from the East coast to the West coast in the symphonic industry. Right, right. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of an insight into what the musician's perspective of, of that has been and maybe some inflection points along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that a lot of the success of not just Los Angeles, but, but the West coast orchestras in general, Oregon's come a long ways and San Diego is they're building another new hall for themselves down there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of it just has to do with economic prosperity on the West coast that is, you know, has, we didn't suffer quite as badly in the dot-com crash as the West coast and, and the mid middle states. Um, so there's more money to ask to to put towards project projects and certainly a lot of civic pride um, it, the way it used to be in the old days and in, uh, in the east coast towns and and they're just you know they're sort of more hampered in a way I think back east by to some extent traditions to some extent economics and so there's a sense of liberty here mm -hmm. There has just been less labor strife in our history. There's only been one work stoppage since 1965. So there's, there's a lot of cooperation. Um, it isn't unhampered by any strife, but it hasn't, it hasn't come to a head here because I think that we've worked hard to build a sense of uh, mutual respect and really recognizing it that the way a business thrives is for everybody to be pulling in the same direction. So there's give and take, but there hasn't been the same element of um, warfare <laughs> that there have sure. been in other locations. I hadn't thought of that. But do you think that there's some element of that, though, that is tied to all the other musical elements that are in Los Angeles in the entertainment business? So you, there's obviously huh. a deep pool of organized musicians in Los Angeles and have been for a long time. Is there just a sense of professionalism in the music industry that maybe some other towns oh, wouldn't have? I I, I would question that. Okay. I don't think so. I mean, you've got the same European roots of, of players and music and, and then just, a, you know, so many of our orchestras, they're, the kids, the kids, I shouldn't call them kids, the young artists come from, you know, a tradition, a long tradition of professionalism and training. And um, I, I think that in, in a sense, there might be more freedom just in general, in styles of music and, and um, opportunities to do stuff. No, I'm just thinking that in a city like Los Angeles or in other big music towns and entertainment towns, the, the fallback of thinking that this is a passion project more than a profession may be more in the water there because the entertainment industry is really the, it is, it's really a company town in some ways, or at least it used to be. Yeah, I, I wonder, though, um, if I would look at it from the other aspect that like, people out here have their passions, but everybody recognizes that, that we're labor, mm -hmm. like the unions are strong mm -hmm. here, the, I mean. especially yeah. in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that there's, uh, you know, there's an aspect of, yes, I it's my passion, 
I love it. I love what I do, but I'm also putting food on the table while I'm doing mm -hmm. it. And so I'm part of the labor movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can't really speak to if that's stronger here than it is elsewhere. I don't know. Sure. But talk to me about how in your, in your tenure in the orchestra, how you've seen the institution change, how its relationship to its city has changed. You know, I would say that because the thing that Los Angeles does best is sell. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We sell entertainment like that's the founding of Los Angeles is, is the entertainment is movies and TV and all that. And so I think that we are able to sell the orchestra in a way that maybe other places haven't been able to do and make it part of the, 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 the vision of the town. And, you know, something that that lots of people know about are interested in that want to go to it. And so I, I would say it's a product of, of good salesmanship. Was there some tension? Was there tension between the demands of an entertainment city and then this fine arts institution? Did you ever see oh. yourselves as trying to hold down one and not intentionally not be the other? Less so nowadays, but there there has always been a very um, strong partition between entertainment and and of the classical music scene. Not necessarily because um, because you didn't want to. I don't know, muddy the waters in terms mm -hmm. of what kind of music you're making, but because they're, I don't think that the entertainment industry ever wanted us competing for their dollars, mm -hmm. you know? And so there's like, you guys do that, we do this. <laughs> um, there are musicians in the Philharmonic way fewer now than used to be who were, um, who were also studio musicians when they could, mm -hmm. they would do studio work. I don't, I don't see that happening that much anymore. Um, partly because there's less work here. You know, a, a lot of the, the commercial work has gone overseas or non-union, which is a travesty. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and places like the Philharmonic and the LA Opera, they're, they're good, solid jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. <laughs> For people with tenure, yeah. Talk to me about when you saw your group start to transform, though, from being, you know, just a, I say just, but being a regular big city orchestra to being a real cultural influencer? You know, I think so much of that was the vision of people like Ernest Fleischmann and Deborah mm -hmm. Borda, and then the music directors that we had, Essa Pekka and uh, Salonen, and, um, you know, even going back to um, uh, Zubin Mehta, just really like this vision that, that we could be, as you said, the tip of the spear of something really vital and, and culturally adaptive and relevant uh, to what's going on. And um, again, you know, you follow the money, the salaries were good. And so mm -hmm. we were able to draw amazing musicians to the orchestra and artists. And although we would have trouble getting conductors to come all the way across the country from Europe, because uh, they mm -hmm. didn't want to travel that far. Um, but they had the board of directors behind them. They, they supported it with the money that was needed and they shared the vision. And I, I think that you can do it anywhere. It really, it doesn't matter that I'm in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It just matters that the people that are here want to make it happen. You mentioned Ernest Fleischmann. Does, does some of that community of musicians ethos, does that live on in the orchestra today? Gosh, isn't everybody doing that now? <laughs> Yeah, but you guys I mean, are so dispersed. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. Look, and we are cooperative groups. And I think that's one of the things that we we don't give ourselves credit for, enough credit for, is how cooperative mm. um, inter-stakeholder groups can be within symphony orchestras. Yeah. However, you guys are doing so many things across your activities. You know, you've got the, the youth orchestra, you've got the, uh, the, the El Sistema stuff that you're doing, the Hollywood Bowl. Right. You know, and then any number of the social justice things you're doing, along with all these new music projects, it does seem like that that original vision that Fleischman had for the orchestra to be many, many things um, seems to be living on, and, and his legacy seems to be living on in the group to some degree. I think that that's true, I, and I think also, you know, again, the music directors and um, the CEOs and the board have had a real vision, recognizing that. I don't think any of us can afford to be just playing standard repertoire and doing mm -hmm. standard concerts. And I mean, in order to stay alive, you know, we really have to revitalize ourselves. I, I, I hesitate to say that we're, you know, going to wind up being a giant teaching institution. Plus, we're all going to have to learn how to sing and dance in addition to playing our mm -hmm. instruments. But uh, I, there, there are elements to that. 
because we've lost the education aspect in all of the public schools, um, if you don't do it yourself, nobody's going to come anymore. So I, I think that we have sort of been forced into the responsibility of, of education and, and taking those other things on, which, you know, why not? We're, you know, we have this great thing to offer society. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that society can, can coalesce around it. So, yeah, I read that to the youth orchestra where something like 90% of the kids go on to college. Are those kinds of really positive outcomes, like happy byproducts of the work you do? Or are you guys setting out with a vision of saying, we're going to have real measurable impact? Yes, real measurable impact. That is the point of the El Sistema program. It's not that all those kids wind up being musicians. It's, mm -hmm. it's that they learn to be citizens, you know, and, and I mean, you could do that through another format. You, they do it through sports. But um, I, I think that particularly because of uh, Dudamel and, and his growing up experience with El Sistema, that's his vision. That's what he brought to us is, is that we were going to commit ourselves to the El Sistema program and, and to, to, um, making Los Angeles society a better place to be for everybody. Mm -hmm. And when that stuff became institutionalized, was it pretty easy to integrate the musicians of the LA Phil into those systems? I mean, in other words, you know, one of the things I've talked about in this uh, podcast with other musicians is that divide between performing artists and teaching mm -hmm. artists. Was there... Yeah. Was there opportunities for the musicians to get involved right away? And if so, was there support for you guys to help you do the job better? Um, there is some crossover between the orchestra members and the people who do the teaching in mm -hmm. El Sistema. We, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one and, and some coaching and stuff like that. But part of the program is teaching teachers how to teach. Mm -hmm. And so we have a pretty busy schedule. So it's not like you have a lot of people in the orchestra who are doing the YOLA program, some of them are doing it. And if you're really interested, there's an opportunity for you to do it. But um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big empire on its own. And it's not like a big mix of people between the LA Philharmonic players and, and the, the program itself. Mm -hmm. Is it hard in an organization that large to kind of keep track of what all the different appendages are doing? I couldn't possibly begin. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 you, you keep busy with your own life and you try to make sure that you know all the repertoire when you sit down to play it. And, I, you know, I don't know if you guys are doing this. We're doing like two and three different programs a week nowadays when, mm -hmm. we're, when we're working. It's like they, they mix up all four Brahms symphonies in one week. And it's like, you, it's insane. The schedule's insane. So there's not a huge amount of time to do other stuff. You know, and that it does seem like the orchestra part of your um, identifying feature is that just the pure volume of what you guys do. There is, and not just the not just the ensemble, but the whole institution is just doing yeah. so much. Do do you feel that there is, like, is that just a symptom of being in a big, big sprawling city where there's just a lot of people to reach? I give you an example, Meredith. When I when I left my first job in Richmond, Virginia, small Southern oh. city. Uh -huh. I, I joined the Phoenix symphony, which is, mm -hmm. you know, a small <laughs> city relative right. to, to uh, Los Angeles, but it's a big, big sprawling city, the sixth largest city in the country. And my, the schedule almost doubled for me. Like it was, you know, it's a, still a six day a week orchestra or whatever, but the workload almost doubled. And it was partly yeah. because we were all over this community yeah, because people were- a lot of outreach. Yeah, yeah. Phoenix does a lot of outreach. They're all over the place. Is there something similar at play with you guys? We do- we don't actually, we used to do so much more run out, so many more run out concerts. Yeah, we, we bring people to us in a way, like uh, diff offering different kinds of concerts at, at both the Hollywood mm -hmm. Bowl and at Walt Disney Concert Hall. So, Was that a real inflection point for you guys building that hall? I mean, obviously it was because it's so oh symbolic God, of yeah. the city, but in terms of like a gathering place for people to come and a destination for all Angelinos, was that really a turning point for when the orchestra it became something else? Was. Yeah, and, and it was a long time coming to fruition. I mean, it was a 10 years from the first donation until the building started to go up. It, they, they 
we had everybody pulling to put that thing up. Our, you know, the Philharmonic itself, and then there were people in the in LA County government and, and the, um, the city government and um, so many people um, and Solomon trying to, trying to make it happen. Um, and it was a huge statement. I mean, it was like, okay, we are here and we're, we're looking towards the future from this moment on. Was Deborah Border brought on to close that deal to make that get that hall built? Was she? Did she had that vision for that place? Was it kind of languishing? Well, it, I, I'm not sure. I could say that it was languishing, but it was just it was very difficult to get. You know, the, it kept getting postponed. Mm -hmm. There was an earthquake, and then the mm -hmm. expense was more, and then we had to raise more money, and so there were a lot of events that happened that that sort of made it more difficult. Um, and I can't, I can't say that she was specifically brought on yeah, for that purpose, but she certainly, yes, was a, was a mover and a shaker towards making it happen. You know, you were saying that there's a, a forward looking element to Southern California. And I'm wondering though, you know, that hall is so futuristic and it is such mm -hmm. a statement about, you know, we're going to be here for another century or, but was there a friction between or a tension between a symphony orchestra, which is in it at its core is a conservative and preservationist institution mm -hmm. at some mm -hmm. level and being future, future looking. I mean, is, is there an inherent tension in that, that we have to balance? It's not that we can't work through it, but maybe it's too much to expect that it's going to go away. Yes. I, I think that there's truth in that, but I also think that we can't afford as an industry to be looking backwards like that. I mean, we, we need our core repertoire. Our audience wants to hear that. And, and there, so that element always has to be at the, you know, the amygdala of what, of what we're doing. But I don't think that we can stay that way. You know, mm -hmm. I think, I think we have to be alive and looking towards new music and composers that are, that are going to change the vision of what this is like as the hall changes the vision of what a symphony hall looks like. Although, I mean, on the inside, you couldn't ask for a better acoustic, mm -hmm. but I, I sort of feel like, you know, we have to diversify the people that work there in terms of, uh, color and race and, and all of those things. We have to diversify the music we play. We, we have to be America. We can't just be European. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have to move forward. We all do. All of our orchestras have to do that. Uh, and, and I'm sure that some of them will, will maintain a higher percentage of the older tradition. But uh, if you want to stay alive and you want to keep bringing money in and being able to put on concerts, you got to get you got to get moving. You know, it's not just us. Uh, there's other orchestras too that are deeply involved um, in uh, in fellowship programs and education programs. And I mean, that's sort of the maybe the the starting line for mm -hmm. diversifying the orchestras. Um, one of the really big problems, it's not like diversifying the orchestras is a new idea. In the 80s, they had fellowships too. And they tried to get this thing off the ground and they really didn't. And I think what has been so successful in Los Angeles is that we have invested for the long term, like put the dollars where the idea is. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody has to do that. Otherwise, you know, you have to commit to those ideas and you have to put the money there and then you have to follow through. Talk to me about the fellowship program. In Los Angeles, we have about uh, four, four, maybe five positions now. Um, so the, these young artists of color, um, they, 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 they audition, they do an interview, they basically do the whole process that we do, minus the interview so mm -hmm. far. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they have a, a salary and housing and um, they play for us. They play, I think, I, I'd have to look at the contract. It's, it's at least 40% of the season. They go on tour with us. I mean, it's, it's like they're full time basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they also do some, some outreach stuff um, in community engagement things. Um, there's really no way to learn how to be an orchestral player without playing in an orchestra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's like, if, if you want to be successful in getting a job somewhere, you have to have the opportunity to do it. Um, like the uh, youth orchestra, you talk about measurable impact. So these kids, these young people that audition for this very competitive spots in the residency program, right. the resident fellows, 
what are some of the objectives, the institutional objectives for them when they get out? Clearly to be better or custom musicians, but is there anything on top of that that the institution wants to see these kids leave with and then inform the next places that they go to? Um, well, I think even while they're there, they're being trained to take auditions. They're taking auditions. You know, they're, they're on the circuit while they're playing with the Philharmonic. Um, I think that that's another sort of a mentorship situation. I think that's also necessary um, to, to give kids a chance um, because they may not have had that, the sort of training that, uh, that other people have had and, and the experience in playing in orchestras and uh, just the money to go take the auditions. Is, mm -hmm, <laughs> it's crazy mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that, yeah, to best prepare them to go get a job um, someplace else. It's, it's absolutely an objective. It's not the objective of the YOLA program, training program. Of course. You know, you made the point just a few minutes ago that orchestras and you guys were played a big leadership role in bringing more contemporary music to the stages. And there is always going to be some pushback from some of your more conservative stakeholders, mm -hmm. be they... Yeah, yeah maybe some musicians, maybe some board members, but not the least of which are audiences. And there's a little bit of that valley of death, that period where you have to get through the hard spot before you can move on to yeah. the fruits of your labors. And that, you know, before all the accolades come in from the New Yorker and the New York Times and the LA Times yeah. and all these great reviews about you guys, there was probably some, you know, a period of trepidation when the sh shift to uh, uh, more intense focus on new music. A similar thing probably happens when you're going to, if you're making the case to your stakeholder groups, why we have to diversify, why, we, why does this institution have to look more like America? That's, yeah. a, I mean, that's a great opening line. Mm -hmm. But what is the, what how do you is the, get there? <laughs> yeah. How do you get there? You know, one of my previous guests so, talked about rhetorical think, diversity where, you know, where, yeah. how do we get to actual diversity? Diversity, diversity. Um, well, look, it, it can't just be on stage. It has to be every aspect of your organization. And I think that we in the, in the classical industry have a huge reckoning ahead of us because as far as nonprofits go, we are way behind in diversifying everything, the administration, the boards, the, you know, the donors, mm -hmm. the patrons, and the people on stage, the musicians on stage. So we, have, we really have to come to terms with our own attitudes. And, and it's not just the musicians on stage. It's, it's the whole institution has to put themselves behind the concept of diversity. They have to commit to it and they have to say, yes, I see where we have fallen down in this aspect and we need to change our behavior. And, mm -hmm. and that's when it happens, you know, and, and I mean, there's, there's lots of paths to that. There's um, bias training and, and programs and, and, I think every institution has to understand for themselves what's going to work best for them, but they have to make the commitment to it. And hopefully after the year that we have all just experienced with the pandemic and the, you know, the, just the opening of the, of the understanding of what white privilege looks like and what our, um, you know, our, what, what am I looking for here, Rob? Our lack of understanding mm -hmm. of, of the, the privilege that we live in and that we need to, we need to open the doors for, for people of color. So one of my previous guests, the one that talked about rhetorical diversity, she's the Dean of the Jordan School of Music in Indianapolis uh -huh. at, the Butler, at Butler University. And she talked about how you needed to have the mentality that you could walk into a faculty meeting and be prepared to throw out the entire curriculum. I mean, of course you're not gonna actually do it, but you have to have the mindset that there are no sacred cows, that any part of this thing could be a bottleneck and no matter how much you care about it, it might be the thing that needs to be corrected. What are some of the elements that you think, like maybe uh, policy wise or maybe attitude wise that we could go about changing to, to start this process? Now, there could be something, I'm thinking a bit like, simple terms. So, you know, 25%, 50% of the repertoire being uh, meeting certain criteria in terms of who wrote it, um, the number yes. of the and soloists. Guest conduct I mean, yes, the music, the soloists, the conductors are all things that you can change on a dime. Mm -hmm. You can just say, we're going to do this and program it. And 
you know, other aspects of it are much more difficult. Where are you going to find the people that are going to serve on your board of directors? And I, I mean, I, I, I'm hoping that they're out there and that, that we can all do that. Um, because as your, your, your previous guest from uh, the college said that, um, everybody has to be in the room for the attitude to change. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it could be a bottleneck. You're not gonna change the institution if you haven't changed the board because they're still gonna be asking for the same things and doing the same things and making the same decisions and hiring the same people. So um, the, all, all of those levels have to change. And I think that, um, I think that the musicians who are not wholly responsible for who gets hired nowadays, but in large measure, you know, we've we've taken on the responsibility uh, and and taken the power away from managements. Don't decide who gets hired anymore. Music directors do, but but we decide who gets into the finals and and how the audition is run and all of that stuff. And I think that we have our own reckoning to to see: Are we being fair? Are we biased or not? Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe you have to you have to include percentages of people of color in your second round or first round, or just make sure that, that there's somebody there to choose from. Um, I mean, there's actually, we just, I don't know if you've heard of the National Alliance for Audition Support. It's a, it's a oh, okay. So NAS is a group of um, uh, artists, administrators from New World Symphony, the Sphinx organization started it, Mellon Foundation funds it, and the league is behind it. And we just uh, we just finished a subcommittee of drawing up recommended guidelines for auditions to diversify, um, to to change to change your mind about what it is that you're doing. Um, and uh, you know we'll see, but I, I think that I think that everybody, or at least the majority of people on all levels of our orchestras, recognize that they want to change now. So I, I think that's what it takes is the desire. Yeah, because our there, there, there is some virtuous circle, of course, in all of this, where I was thinking as you were talking about the, the quest to diversify your board. Now, your organization is very high profile. It's very high profile in the city. And as you program in more high profile places, more diverse composers and more diverse solos and conductors, that creates even more awareness in the community and creates the yeah. probably a greater likelihood that you're gonna attract an interested party um, to, to yeah. the board. And, and then that whole thing continues to build upon itself. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the behind the scenes stuff, so to speak, with us in the, in the musician side of it though, you know, we have a lot of pride in our blind audition process. Uh, you know, other institutions, elite institutions, uh, corporate America, Ivy League colleges, the United States military have all approached the orchestras to better understand our hiring processes because there is some value to that. But we ca obviously can't ignore that those worked up to a point and this stated out the stated goal has not aligned with the outcomes in terms yeah, but of I, I think that I think that the problem actually may be that we're not quite as fair as we think we are. Like there's there's this idea that that you know and I get it because musicians are they don't they certainly it's not that they just don't want to think of themselves as being biased, but I think that they truly believe they're not. And and I think that the process that we've designed, which is not entirely blind, and mm -hmm. it does involve inviting people or trying people out that you know, and you don't necessarily know people of color, and so you don't invite them to come. Um, so it, it's not as fair as we think it is. No, I think it's, look, I, I, to, to be clear, we're on the same page, but I'm not, I'm not even really playing devil's advocate, but because I, I do want to talk to the process, because I hope we get somewhere on it, which is that Yes, we're not as fair as we think we are, but because we've gotten sloppy with the process, right? The, in the sense that, like you said, you know, we're, there's a lack of blindness because we invite so many people, the screen comes down in the third round at most auditions probably across the country. Whereas the people that I've, some of the literature that I've read about other institutions interested in the way we do our business, make the process much, much more rigorous, actually. They, they go farther, much farther than we do to anonymize the candidates, be they officer right. candidates in the army or people applying for to teach at Harvard Kennedy School. 
And so the flip side of that though, is what my former boss, um, Teddy Abrams talked about Mm -hmm. that we should, as, as musicians though, there is an element where we should be going out and looking for the very best person to Mm -hmm. anonymize the process even farther may actually dig us into a deeper hole. And so I can, depending on which side of the bed I get up on the morning, I can really (laughs) empathize with either side. Yes. I totally understand that. Yeah. I think the flaw in that thinking is kind of the assumption and, and correct me if I'm wrong in what you're saying, but if you're, if you're saying that, well, maybe we shouldn't anonymize because we're not going to get the person that we, we desire, um, is kind of assuming that you're going to have to lower your standards in a way in order no, to actually, hire. No, actually, actually, no. Okay, I don't. I misunderstanding. I, you know, that's. I think that's a perfectly reasonable conclusion to draw on some level. But what Teddy was talking mm-hmm. about, and to a certain degree, I've talked about quite a bit, is that the audition process itself, in because when it becomes so anonymized that it becomes a feat of strength. It becomes an Olympic uh, exercise oh, yeah, more yeah, than yeah. an okay, artistic. So not role. anonymized, but but like shortened to the point of absurdity where you really have no ch- opportunity to judge the person as a mm-hmm. musician. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what we do about that because you want to be fair. You want as many people as possible to have a chance to come in. And I mean, if you, if you then have to end up spreading out your preliminaries over a week in order to hear mm-hmm. 300 people for 10 or 15 minutes a piece and really hear them, you know, instead of for 60 seconds, which is, it's absurd. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've sort of been hoist on our own petard in trying to make it fair and trying to give everybody an opportunity. And now, now that we've created these very desirable jobs with a good salary and tenure and, and all mm-hmm. of the perks, um, they're just being, we're being flooded with people that want to come. And if we could, I don't know, triple the number of orchestras that we have, that would be fantastic, but we can barely keep the ones funded that we have. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what the solution is really. Well, I think it's it's a process of trial and error and uh, yeah. different iterations. I, I'm just always very curious about the strong responses that the these those few articles that were written in the past, let's say, six months or so, uh-huh. about mm-hmm. orchestras in the just the the spectrum of emotions it elicited from people within our ranks, but also Uh people kind of on the outside of classical music and uh, just the diversity of opinions, so to speak, about, about reforming the process or not reforming it, uh, reforming it at all. Well, I think, I think that what you're going to find eventually is that it it is going to be a diverse process in hiring because people are going to have to, institutions are going to have to come up with their own process. How are they going to change themselves to hire the people that, I mean, I don't even think that necessarily the Chicago symphony is going to be hiring the same kind of musician that I don't know, Phoenix or, or St. Louis is looking for because they, they, other places, their desire is not just diversity, not just inclusion, but to have people with different kinds of skills. They play their instruments. Great. They're like the best that you could hope that they could be, but they can also talk. They can also, you know, entertain an audience or, I I mean, they just have other skills. They can be a spokesperson or, well, do you think this is a time then, and I know this is because you oversee our players conference. And so you're, you're hearing a lot of feedback and for yeah. better, for worse, we kind of see ourselves almost as like franchises, right? We don't have a home office in the, in the orchestra <laughs> business, but we all kind of function like franchises, We just you have different budget sizes, but you know, we kind of have the same workplace Our contracts look very similar. In our right. hiring well, I mean, we've spent decades yes, getting that. here. Yes, you know? I, yeah. I, uh, and, and so <laughs> very loath to give it up or to make compromises or to change the paradigm. Um, but I just think that we are being forced by external circumstances to change. Absolutely. So, but is one of the forces that, one of these external forces, would, would one of the possible outcomes though be that, orchestras become less homogenized in the way they do business. So in other words, we have this market out there right now, this audition Mm -hmm. circuit. And to Mm -hmm. some degree, we're all competing and we just end up where we end up. But could orchestras become 
identifiable. And I don't mean in like some splitting hairs way, like the Chicago brass sound is different than the Philadelphia string sound. I mean, in really different ways that the orchestra is, has a different product, has a different, has a different set of priorities and would attract different players. Do you think as players, we would benefit from having really um, identifiable uh, unique identities to our institutions rather than being like one sort of national marketplace. Homogenous. Yeah. Um, I, you know, Rob, I think it's already happening. I, I, I mean, I see in, in different orchestras in different places that they don't just play symphonic repertoire. They do like, we have a new music series. Everybody's got a chamber music series. They do, they do engagement programs, um, different kinds of programs that they present from the stage. And so I think that the change is, is going on mm -hmm. as we speak. And I think that in different locations, you're gonna wind up with a different, uh, I think it's, it's in process already. Mm -hmm. And our, you know, our contracts have changed to evolve around that in terms of, I mean, you, you, you don't wanna go with the dreaded service conversion thing, but, but there are different pay scales for different kinds of music that you play, different sizes of ensembles and, um, you know, different yeah, my, my compensations for runouts and. Sure, I, look, I, I think our contracts are really wonderful documents and they, mm -hmm. and they are custom tailored to the individual institution because they've evolved with them over time. Um, I right. am in no way advocating that we are, we, we abandon collective bargaining, obviously. But what I am wondering though, because it's because we look to you guys, when I say we, the industry often looks yeah. to you guys and, and as one of the truly unique institutions in the country that has a recognizable brand for lack of a better word, but like uh -huh. a rec recognizable image recognizable sound, recognizable product. Whereas a lot of the rest of us, although we are, we have filled with wonderful, passionate, unique individuals, our circumstances are formed more by economics and we're, we're mm -hmm. fitting the same product into the same mold, just with different sets of resources. We're constrained by right. resources more than we're- I, I understand. Right. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but I, I, I just think it's a vision thing. I, I don't think it, yes, economics are important, but I think that when you have a situation where you have somebody, musician, management, what a conductor, whatever, that really has a burning desire to do this project. Like I feel this project is gonna change our community and the relationship that our community has to us. You can sell that to somebody that's gonna fund it for you. You know, it, it's not rocket science. It's like, but you really have to have that vision and that desire and you have to put everybody behind it in the institution. And I, I, I feel in some instances that because of the lack of functioning relationships in many of our orchestras, um, that you can't unite people mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. a different vision. It becomes very difficult. Uh, and, and if you could just have more conversation and a better understanding and more exchange and, you know, the ideas flow from that and, and money flows to the ideas. <laughs> you know, and, I'm curious your thoughts then on how musicians become more activated in this visioning process. And so obviously the folks that are in Ixam or the Ixam representatives are some of the most activated mm -hmm. people within our ranks. How do you yeah. see the conference maybe taking on a new, a new role, a new vision for itself perhaps in, in going forward and shaping well, institutions? Look, I mean, we struggle with the same participation problems that orchestras struggle on their committees. It's the same 20% of the people that do all the work for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, I, I just, I, I understand that musicians are so um, self-involved in their music. It's, it's their passion. It's their life. It's the one thing that's so important to them. But I think that the institution that they work in, that their community, their tribe, whatever you want to call it, is also important. And I think that anything that we, you and I, Ixam, the committees that are in the orchestras can do to inspire people to participate and just be, you know, go to that board meeting that they've invited to you. Go sit and have a drink with somebody that you don't usually talk to. Um, go out in the lobby and talk to people and I, just like make friends, make, mm -hmm. make communication, talk, make ideas happen in, in your institution and participate in the structures that already exist.
I um, wonder though, this, if this participation process or the lack of it um, across the, uh, the body of the group, maybe a place that that comes back to though, is the lack of the interview, as you alluded to before, that we're testing people for one set yes, of skills sure. and we have to refine those to a ridiculous degree of specificity. But yeah. without You're getting into some very, very difficult um, psychological yeah. issues with being an orchestral musician. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think there's so many things that play into that, but you, you have spent your youth you know, aiming at this fantastic experience and you got the job and you get there and you did it. And it's like, there's a certain element of work a day to it. And mm -hmm. you're, you know, you, you, as a great orchestral musician, certainly a string player, you have to subjugate yourself to the larger body. And so there's so much frustration, emotional frustration involved in like, this isn't my project anymore. Mm -hmm. I have to do, you know, what, I, I have to blend, I have to be a part of the body, which has its own kind of satisfaction, but it can also be a deterrent and a disappointment. And I think that it combined with your, your manic, my, oh my God, it's gotta be perfect every day. There's just such a level of, of um, lack of satisfaction in the job, mm -hmm. which spills over. I see it every, I think we all see it everywhere. And, and also, I think there's an addiction to those highs that you get in a great performance. It's not going to happen every day. So you have to adjust your own expectations to like, okay, I'm going to bring everything I have, all of my focus and all of my attention, and maybe try to wake up your stand partner while you're doing it. Um, but I, I, I just, yeah, I, I hear you. Has to do with the, yeah. As a section leader too, I'm, I'm, uh, trying to trying to project enthusiasm trying to project um, engagement all the time because we're trying to lead we're, we we're all capable of leading by example but i'm also trying to get at a little bit more formal things we could do so we were talking a minute ago about the pipeline and the pipeline starts very early it starts when you're three years old or whatever and you know up to the point where you win your job and then you're on your way and as i've said before on this podcast a number of times you know, the, the audition process works more often than it doesn't because we're looking to hire a great player, a ton of players show up, abracadabra, <laughs> we go through the day, we get a great player. The, the, the challenge in our business has never been attracting people. The challenge of it has been to sustain them through a career. Mm -hmm. And nothing about intergenerational turnover fixes mm -hmm. that unless we do something um, to tap into people's uh, interests. And I'm wondering if we should have a interview section um, it, it, as a part of our hiring process to at least kind of understand who the person is that we're hiring and what they're interested in. Because the, the negative byproduct of the anonymization that we we're talking about before is we're also basically to come out as cogs in the machine and not mm -hmm. human beings. Mm -hmm. And do you think that like a small technical change in the way we hire people could actually start to, to unleash downstream benefits um, to yeah, lifelong? I, I mean, I, I do think that, as I said earlier, you know, we, we have kind of painted ourselves into a corner over the decades in trying to perfect the process of auditioning both for the people that come and for the people that are doing it and the product that you end up with. And, you know, with the best of intention to be fair to everybody, but it has so limited the process now that um, you, you, do, you do end up with great musicians who are great technicians, but you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Well, when you were, so when you were back at Juilliard and you're on the East Coast, I mean, I'm sure you were hearing these same conversations happen um, in your teachers and you would maybe see people in the New York Philharmonic having these same conversations in the 1970s. I mean, is that fair to say? I can't really say that because I wasn't, I mean, involved in orchestra to the same extent back then that I am now. Uh, I mean, I, when I was referring to the orchestras earlier in the 80s having fellowship programs, they were trying to diversify mm -hmm. That's true. the players on stage. Um, and and I, I meant that specifically. Um, I'm just a little frustrated. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, yeah. Meredith. I'm just no. saying that from my own experience, when I was in, the yeah. when I was in college in the 90s, um, in the early aughts, uh, 
I heard these same conversations and it is a little disappointing to me that I've almost 20 years into my career now and, and nothing has changed. No, I would say nothing has changed. And for, <laughs> the, for me, the main thing that changed was seeing that there was a different way working with Teddy Abrams and that, but that, again, yes. that's a personality. Yes. It's not a process, you know, whereas yeah. I look to you guys and it seems like you keep repeating success because you have good processes in place rather than just relying on one transformative personality to come in and fix everything. And I'm yeah. wondering how as players, we can start to build momentum for us and help and help sustain our careers over time. Um, that doesn't rely on just having a great conductor or like a hotshot concert master or whatever, whatever the secret sauce is in the places where it's working. Yeah. I think um, I, I hear what you're saying about the the one personality that that comes in with a different vision, and to some extent, we ourselves are hampered by our own contracts, by our own uh, traditions, by you know the the way we came up to create these organizations. Uh, the organization, the structure of the organization organization itself is hampered by the structure. Any bureaucracy is over time; mm -hmm. it loses the flexibility and the and the ability to change and to to reinvent itself. Um, As a musician leader, then, are you putting a priority on musicians understanding the benefits of flexibility? Maybe, maybe revisiting. Well, you know, I, if I have one vision coming coming in five years ago, or yeah, I guess it's five years ago mm -hmm. as chair of Ixom, it has been to really get people to talk to each other, not just musicians to musicians, but to get them to talk to their managements and to talk to their donors and to talk, you know, just develop those relationships because those relationships will change the direction of the institution. And then the contract will change around the intent. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I just, I like, even as in terms of Ixom getting along with the AF of M, mm -hmm. I just want them to work together and to be able to exchange information freely and not come to the table with these um, preconceived ideas and the mistrust and, and all of this stuff. I, Mistrust for good reason. I, I get that. Mm -hmm. But but somehow you have to heal those relationships and you have to move past that. And I, I think that, you know, diversity is a perfect example of it's the same kind of issue of, of being able to see the other person, the other party as an equal, as another mm -hmm. human being that we can exchange ideas and do things together. Um, and so again, I, I sort of come back to the, you really have to have the working relationship in order to make those changes. Do you see from your, from your chair that your chair of Ixon, that is that mm -hmm. there are just wildly different interpersonal um, d dynamics between orchestras. There's some that are basically non-functional and there are places perhaps <laughs> like my orchestra where we have the, when I came here two years ago, I couldn't believe how, I don't want to say harmonious because we have our differences, but it's a really healthy working relationship. Over my career, I've been a part of all kinds, believe me. Basically, yeah. in Phoenix, we basically ground to a halt in, uh -huh. in trench warfare with our management and then yeah. uh, seen it all kinds. Is So are you seeing like a, a national a tapestry of orchestras that have very different concerns and very different dynamics? Uh, maybe not very, but... I, I see orchestras that fall into the trap of contentious relationships time and again, because the people don't change that much. Like, mm -hmm. again, if you have mm -hmm. the same board members all the time and you have the same musicians negotiating the contract, that the attitudes don't change. Interesting. So um, sorry to interrupt Mer Meredith, but is it, no, no, then ahead. is it, do the, do the issues then fall into certain buckets that there may be actually less ideological or less there maybe the problems are actually more about personalities than they are about well, actual the personalities issues. are attached to their ideologies. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is ideological. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain places where it's like, I am not compromising with this union. What I want is a non-union mm -hmm. orchestra, and I'm not going to give you any more money until you break the union. And then there's the opposite side of that, which is like, um, I, I will not make any compromises. I don't just, you go out and raise more money. That's mm -hmm. your job. Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It, it's. So it's what are some nature. of the icebreakers then? What are some of the successful icebreakers that you've seen between those kind of um, gridlocks? I think that there's been a lot of change actually since, since the, the dot-com bust, you know, when uh, Minnesota was out for a year and a half and Detroit was out for eight months or 10 months and, um, in Louisville, 
they, they yeah and louisville <laughs> i mean or places that were broken mm -hmm. by the rigidity because they could not withstand the 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 storm mm -hmm. um and and i think that i think that there is a lot of shift in that regard because people recognize like this like the pandemic i mean we have had a handful of orchestras that got kicked to the curb like the met in nashville and indianapolis and oregon and phoenix mm -hmm. um and they just said we're not dealing with it but every place else regardless of the fact that there's no money coming in like except for the donations um they have found a compromise because they work together. You know, they're they're like understanding that that we have a crisis here. We need to work together to figure it out. And in most places, they have. It's been painful. Um, you know, I'm, we're down to sixty percent of of what we make. But and I I don't even know how long it's going to go on because we might not be back to work until next season. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, yeah, but, I want to uh, maybe we could maybe we could hover over the pandemic for a minute and what what mm -hmm. might come from it. So here in Rochester we took uh basically a 20% pay cut and we're pretty active um with our streaming. Yeah, you guys and, are still working. Yeah, we're working. I mean, and we're doing <laughs> chamber music and we 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 we've we've had to make some amendments recently to accommodate the fact that COVID is picking up unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. but we're still working, we're still putting out concerts we're quite flexible across the institution. And I've also seen that our development, uh, Americans are quite generous right now. We, you know, the stock market mm -hmm. is quite high. Uh, people aren't spending money on going out to dinner or traveling. And maybe, maybe those aren't causal relationships, but they, they seem like they could be, um, but that people are willing to donate. So I also uh, serve on the development committee for an incredible local music school here in town that's been around for a oh, century. Cool as well as the Susan B. Anthony Museum. And both of these oh, institutions wow. are seeing like, you know, really surprised, happily surprised that they've been able to keep going because of the generosity oh. um, yeah. of donors. And so is this a time where we can actually reset or reassess our relationships within our institutions, but also perhaps with donors and find out mm -hmm. what it is they really want? I mean, is there a way for musicians to activate those conversations? I, I, there, there are. I mean, I think that you sort of have to. I, I'm not sure how anxious managements are for musicians to go out and sort of, you know, <laughs> go out on their own and start making those relationships. But in a lot of places, that's necessary because the management is not involved, mm -hmm. um, and they're not doing their job. Uh, I, you have to build the relationships, and if you build them as with management as an intermediary, or if the musicians and the donors do it themselves. Um, I, I think again, it all comes down to, we are a triumvirate of power in our each of our orchestras mm -hmm. and every one of those power centers has to cooperate if you're gonna have a successful business. Um, you, can't, you can't be poking your donors in the eye with a sharp stick every time management says, no, we're not gonna pay you that much. You, you, you have to maintain the relationships and, and it's a different formula everywhere you go. Within that triumvirate that you're talking about, that three-legged stool, that, that other whatever mm -hmm. metaphor we're going to use, there is a resistance, I think, though, to asking questions about what is our community really want from us? Because the answer might not be what any of us really want to hear sometimes. I mean, that's, I mean of course, there are open-minded musicians and open-minded board members. But, mm -hmm. you know, we've had these donors, by and large, across the country who've helped us stay alive through mm -hmm. this dark period. On the other side of it, though, where do we come out and possibly have amended priorities or new priorities about how we disperse our art that also might, I don't want to say diminish, but take away from the core concert presenting organizations that we've become? And, and if so, is that a schism or is that a friction that we just have to manage? Does that make sense? I understand what you're saying. I, I don't think it is a friction. I think it's a question, again, of diversifying, of inclusion, of enlarging the process of what you do, bringing in fresh blood, fresh ideas, you know, um, new money, if you want if you want to be that sort of callous about it in a way. But um, more ideas. I, it, I think that there are places that are that are stuck 
in the European tradition of what a great, it doesn't mean that you can't be a great orchestra. You can do all of those other things too. And you might not like the new music program and it might not be your favorite thing to do. And then there are other people who love the challenge. Mm -hmm. And so I think you must en enlarge your board and your vision. You have to do it. Otherwise, um, you know, it's just not gonna survive. I read, I know that you, you know, Timothy Snyder, the Yale philosopher, you, you oh, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So he wrote the book on, author on authoritarianism, but his most recent book is about the healthcare system. And he had a line oh. in there that really caught me off guard. It was um, that public institutions are the infrastructure of solidarity. And of course he was talking more about public schools and public libraries. Um, but I think that civic institutions can fall into that category too. And as you were saying that musicians are doing more things and we're bringing more interest to the table, right. that coming out of this pandemic, musicians either need to be empowered to or take the reins on seeing ourselves and seeing our institutions as a part of that infrastructure of solidarity as we try and repair the fabric of our community. And that might yes. mean giving up certain... Um, it's not giving it up. Mm -hmm. You okay, still good. do it regardless. You know, it's always going to be at the, in the, the wheelhouse of what you do. But I think, as you said, referring to Timothy Snyder, when he says that, you know, the orchestras are such an antiquated institution, mm -hmm. they're just, they're, they need to move ahead with the times. Um, and which means doing different repertoire and presenting different soloists and, and doing different kinds of music. It doesn't mean that you give up. But it also doesn't mean that you show up every Thursday and you play, you know, to, what are we going to program this week that we can afford to put in there and, and then come back and do the same thing next week with all the same repertoire, just, you know, a different composer. I, I think you really have to mix it up. Okay. I think this is, this is really fantastic stuff. And I mean, obviously, like I said, you guys, uh, we really look to you as, as leaders in this, but I want to ask you now player to player as someone that's been in this grind for a while. And I want, <laughs> I want to know what your practices are in terms of maintaining like your own sort of integrity around the instrument. So is there a lot of chamber yeah. music in well, your life is a lot of teaching. Talk to me about that. Some. Um, I mean, I, I, I think we all love chamber music because it's your chance to shine and it's so personally gratifying to play that repertoire or any kind of repertoire really where you, you know, I'm a violist. I like to come out from underneath the shrubbery every once in a while and say, hey, I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and so I think that yes, chamber music, I, I don't actually teach because I, I've never been able to sustain the responsibility that I feel for, for somebody else's you. life. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to take it on. But I went through a period where I exactly like what you said, like, oh my God, I'm so bored with this job. And I really, I can't stand my colleagues anymore. And why am I here? Can I go do something else? I absolutely went through a period like that. But I think that coming to the understanding and, and I heard on one of your other podcasts, you were talking about meditation and focus and really being present in what you're doing. And I think that that is the key in every situation, no matter what you're doing, is really being present to the, to the piece. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it can be new music, or it can be old music, it can be whatever it is, but, but you just really engage. Get rid of the criticism or the like, I don't want to be doing this or, and just do it and be there. Um, so that, I mean, that's kind of my magic bullet. And it doesn't mean that I show up to work every day and I love the person that I'm sitting with or that I love the piece that I'm playing, but I'm doing it and I'm there and I'm doing it with my whole being. Um, do, you so. have, do you have routines around your workplace now that help you get into that mindset? Or is it just an attitude? I think it's just an attitude. I don't, I don't it's, it is a practice in the sense mm -hmm. that, that you bring that awareness with you wherever you go. And I think the more you do it, the easier it gets. Again, it's, it's, it's bringing yourself to the table. Mm -hmm. It's like being aware and interacting and-, and Did you see your own shifts in attitude? Did they correspond to something happening in the orchestra? Was it, did it correspond to with like a new music director coming on board or some shift in the organization? <laughs> you know, actually, um, I think a lot of things in all of our life trajectories contribute to like, there can be outside influences and things in your life that you don't like that are happening. And you just sort of reach this 
grind and depression. And, and I was there and I was looking around in the orchestra and Blumstedt was conducting. And I'm like, how does this 90 year old guy, how is he so energetic and so happy and so full of life? And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that you become a Seventh Day Adventist, but it does mean that there is that stream of consciousness running through all of us all the time. And you just have to put your foot in it. You know, mm -hmm. you just have to change what you're looking at and what you're filling your mind with. And, and I mean, that was kind of my turning point was just like, how does he do that? Mm -hmm. It's relieving to hear, or comforting to hear you even say this, that you've kind of had these ebbs and flows with the, with the career. Talk to me humanity. about, you know, it's true. I mean, it's, it'd be impossible to expect anything different. And even it's almost naive of me. It almost sounds like a board member or something saying you, you should love this, right? <laughs> you love it. Why would, why would you want to be paid to why, do it? Or why would you want to be, or how could you possibly be bored? Uh, I'm curious though, then in 2016, what brought you to taking on this new responsibility with Ixom? Like what, where were you in your career where that seemed like a good fit? Uh, <laughs> I think um, it, it sort of fell to me to do it in a way. Again, you know, going back to there's not enough, there's so many talented, capable people out here there who could be doing this job that I'm doing. And it's a willingness to do it. And, and um, it's like, you don't have to be a genius. You just have to be willing to do it. And I think that uh, I, I was on the governing board at the time. I had been for a long time, like mm -hmm. at least 10 years. And um and Bruce Ridge, who was fantastic, he, he did an amazing job. He really needed to not do it anymore. And so it was like, well, who is going to do it? Mm -hmm. So it just kind of fell to me in the same way that becoming the delegate from Los Angeles Philharmonic to Ixon fell to me. One of the reasons that I do do it and that I have stayed for so long is because of the incredible people that are involved. I mean, they give of their time for no recompense. They, they are excited and they love what they do and they want to do this for their colleagues and their, for their orchestra. And I mean, that kind of humanity is so inspiring to be around and to work with uh, that I would, yeah, I mean, it eats up an awful lot of my life, but I would do it in a heartbeat because, mm -hmm. because it's worth it. <laughs> When you follow somebody into an organization, when you follow somebody like Bruce, mm. is it, does it feel like, you know, he such an amazing advocate for us and for mm -hmm. the organization. Oh, incredible. I mean, he turned the vision around, right. you know, during the dot-com crisis. <laughs> do, do you feel then that as a leader that you kind of pick up where he left off or do you have to start. No, I am and... not that person. I, you know, I, I think that in any situation where you're like the chairman of your orchestra committee or whatever, you know, you bring your own personality to it and your own vision and you, you do lead, but you lead by serving. And so mm -hmm. you're there to do what needs to be done and you do it the best way you can or, or like, okay, I think this might work or that might work. But a, a person in a position of leadership really has to listen to the people around them to the institution, to what it needs, and you fill that role. Because the organization is like part advocacy group, part think tank, you know, it's like, it, it's a lot of things. Right. It, but it, it's it, mostly connective tissue between mm -hmm. the orchestras. It's like mostly a communication network and what's working here, what's working there. How do we, you know, get people to, to, to this information or see how they might be able to improve this situation. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're, in a sense, we have no money and we have no power. All we can do is to, to, to try to talk to people and, and to keep the lines of communication open. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean by being a think tank to some degree where these ideas, yeah. they kind of percolate into the, into the stream of consciousness or the bloodstream of the industry and kind of circulate, right. around, or circulate around the country. Do you think that um, our advocacy groups be it Ixom or the union itself have to become mm -hmm. sort of less reactive or parts of the institution and maybe a little bit more taking a little bit more of a leadership role in the way they see themselves. All labor organizations have taken such a beating in the last 40 years mm -hmm. that the people, us who are in it, you and me and everybody in our orchestras have taken on the same degree of denigration and they look at the union as a third party bureaucracy, what are you doing for me? Our union is us. 
Mm-hmm. It's what we do. It's how we interact with each other, what our vision is and how we work together. And I think that um, I hope that, that that will start to change um, as the attitude towards union labor changes in this country. Um, and the legislation, which has been hampering us, um, I, I just, it, again, it's, it's not them, it's us, like mm-hmm. Bernie says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a. I feel like there's time to be somewhat optimistic about the change in direction, the change in sentiment in the country yeah. around unions. Um, I think that some of the stuff with public sector unions in the news doesn't always help us, uh, police unions in particular. Um, but yeah. the but obviously, you know, you see this push into labor of journalists and some other white collar workers. And that I think is an important, although they're probably a small part, it's an important part. And to have somebody in the white house talking, talking at least rhetorically about uh, talking about us. I think it's, I think it's a good sign. And yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm sure it is. And you know, I mean, he's Biden has made changes already in the, in the national labor relations board. And, and so I think that it's going to change and, but, but, we must participate, you know, mm-hmm. as union members, as laborers. And, and again, I think that as artists, we tend to think of ourselves as that and not as people who are putting food on the table through our art. Mm-hmm. We are both of those things. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's really important for, for us to wake up, which is not to say, you know, you, you have to like wake up and then go get your pitchforks and torches and, and make a big scene. You have to work together to make it a better situation. Yeah. And I think that we have to also find out, and I say we, I mean, the entire institutions that we work for um, and that we comprise, we have to figure out how we can add more value to our communities and what mm-hmm. Absolutely. they want yes. from us. And I'm not saying that that will solve money problems, but it, you know, there. I, I read in one of your pieces, you talked about um, how we risk becoming less relevant. And relevant, well, we have become very elitist. That's true. We and it's know, a and, well-earned. And we have to change that. It's well-earned criticism on our. It part. is. It is absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I can't afford to go to my own concerts. I don't make enough money to buy tickets yeah, to Walt I, Disney I concert have to say, Hall, this is what, which I is have absurd. To say one of the disappointing <laughs> things about your organization, I will say. Yeah. Is that well, it's not efforts. just me. I mean, other places too. But that must well, change. I when I was a member of the Phoenix Symphony, I used to drive out a few times a year and hear you guys. And the sticker shock was really, it's really something coming into that hall. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about in terms of relevance, there's a, a business writer who, who's the stuff I enjoy reading and listening to, uh, who talks about how the uh, pandemic has accelerated economic trends by 10 years overnight, essentially. So wherever you mm-hmm. thought you were going to be in 10 years, you're there now. And for us, the nonprofit world may be a little different but where we might find ourselves in six months from now, when maybe we're back on stage, is that we're not 10, 10 years down the road economically, but we're 10 years less relevant than we were six months ago or nine months ago. And if we don't- I come- wonder, yeah. Well, I, I, I wonder- think that there's a real appetite for, for us. I, there is an appetite and I think that people will come back. I mean, I know there's a lot of competition for entertainment dollars, but people will come back. But I don't think that musicians should expect that their contracts are going to bounce back. Like, I agree with you that it, there will probably be a honeymoon of demand for about six mm-hmm. months where people just want to do whatever they can get tickets they can get their hands on. I absolutely believe that. Mm-hmm. But when we start to get back to an equilibrium of earned revenue and contributed revenue uh-huh. and going about our business, oh. if we don't have a better case for ourselves, I think we're going to find ourselves 10 years down from where we thought we would be, which is 10 years further outside the mainstream of American contemporary. Yes, our business has to change. Yeah. Our business has to change. Well, Meredith, is there anything else that I, you want to, is there anything I missed? <laughs> I don't know. It seems like we covered an awful lot of ground there. I was hoping we could talk more about your your career, early part of your career, but uh, we'll get to that another time. Oh, um, yeah. it's. I mean, it got me where I am. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had you know, a rich career in uh, the East Coast and the, uh, in the West Coast, and I would be curious to hear about that. But look, I really appreciate your making time oh, and being so candid with me. Thank you so much for me. having me. And fascinating to talk to you about this. 
Thank you for listening. The music on the show, as always, is by Craig Wagner, a virtuoso guitarist from Louisville, Kentucky. My next guest is Holly Mulcahy, violinist, blogger, and concertmaster of the Wichita Symphony. So please go ahead and hit subscribe.